Um, okay, so this week what happened, uh, my husband's birthday was last week, but I forgot because I'm like, yeah. I, I just don't think about things like that. So this is when you're thankful that you have a church that sends out like, happy birthday. Well, somehow I got his email. Happy birthday, Rob. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. So I had to call him in the morning and say, hi, sweetie, happy birthday. I've been waiting for this exact moment to tell you all day, even though I completely forgot. <laughs> so um, Cheyenne, as most of you know, is, uh, she was here with us last week. She is a senior in co- college, senior in high school. She's looking to go to colleges. So her dream college is Point Loma and she is going to like apply there and, and we've got to figure out what that looks like. Anyway, she says, mom, I'm really afraid I'm not going to get into Point Loma. So she see, I walk in her room and she's one of these kids, like most moms get their kids stuff ready for college. Like, okay, let's, start looking for scholarships and let's get the application filled out. Nope, I do none of that, okay? She's just really good at that, so she figures it out on her own. Anyway, I walked in her room and there's this big packet from Wheaton College back in Illinois. And I walked by and she goes, I'm going to apply to Wheaton today. And I said, so I put my hand over the thing and I said, dear Jesus, do not let Cheyenne get, (laughs) get, get in Wheaton. I said, honey, don't even bother. I've just prayed over that application. They'll turn you down. So let's, I said, Chicago's a long way away. I just don't want you. California's fine. No Chicago. So it was cute. So that afternoon she texts me and she puts this really big, guess what? And I wrote back and I said, what? Did Wheaton call you and tell you that they're completely full? And she's like, no, I got nominated for homecoming queen. Aww, I know, it's so cute. Because she's only been at this high school for two years. Like, she's a senior. And I, I said, I, how do you even know people? It's a huge school. So it was kind of a big thing. And it made me feel good because it's like, you know, she's not really, she just, she loves Jesus. And that, that was a good thing. So I'll let you know if she wins. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wear her crown next week if she does. So... <laughs> Okay, if you're new, or if you're watching us online and you're new, we are going through a series. We're going through the Gospel of Luke, apparently really, really, really slowly, because we have been, I I say this seems like part one million, okay, of people like us. You're going to be glad in a couple weeks that we're going to have a new set, because you're probably sick of seeing all the people up there. But what we're trying to do is say, look, the disciples, we stopped. It's hot in here, isn't it? Um, Okay, because I'm, no, okay, so you just let me know. I see fanning people and it makes me nervous. Um, So what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what the disciples did and how they acted because however they acted and however they talked is how we should be acting and how we should be talking. And so we've spent a whole lot of time figuring out what each of the disciples did, how, what, what made them disciples, and we're going through what the word disciple means, which means learner, studier, and we learn and study so that we can um, share it with other people. Now, if you weren't with us last week or if you're not on our email list or Facebook, here's what we're doing um, in the mornings from here on out. Every morning you will get a question of the day. And we've been doing this. I've heard back from so many people that are so excited. You know, why do I have to get baptized? What, can I lose my salvation? Uh, what, what is the Bible all about? Okay, so every day you get a question and it has an answer to it. And my the idea is so that we can study every day together and learn something. And in 365 days, we have learned 365 new things at the Bible. And now we have something. So when somebody says, I don't understand what the Bible's all about. And you'll be like, well, let me tell you, because I just learned that last week. Okay. So that's what we're doing because I, I realized last week, I said, you know what? We are a women's Bible study. And when people like us on Facebook, I'm assuming they like women's Bible study. But one day a week for 45 minutes doesn't cut it. So I'm like, you know, something's got to change. I want this to be a daily thing that we can learn when we're not here on Wednesday. So anyway, if you're not on Facebook, like us on there, or just go onto our page and the question will be there every morning. And that's what we're going to be doing. So, okay, the premise here, 269 verses in the Bible that say disciple, only three that say the word Christian. So we're getting rid of the word Christian. We're saying, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And what it means is I am a disciple. And that means a lot different than what just the word Christian. So I want to talk today about this idea of obedience. And I, I, I wrote a little thing yesterday about it on, on um, an email and I forgot to send it out to you. 
I, I, I named this series, I Hate Rules, because I hate rules. I just do. I, I'm tired of people telling me that I have to do things. I'm tired, and I think as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, um, sometimes we get tired of churches telling us you have to do this and do that and do that. And, and so we, we come across these verses. Uh, they're in your handout. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then Luke 6, 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Okay, so we've got two verses that say Jesus says it's very, very important that we obey. And my question is, why? Why? Because I think all of us have come from different backgrounds, and all of us will answer it in three different ways, and I'll tell you what those three ways are in a few minutes. But I, I tend to rail at the word obey, because I want to know why do I have to do that? Because when someone just tells me, you know, you need to stay in your marriage because out of obedience— you have to read your Bible out of obedience. You have to uh, love that person that you just can't stand out of obedience. You need to obey. Okay, I get bogged down, and I went into a depression a few years ago, and I can trace it back to this feeling of obey, 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 obey. And I'm like, I don't want to do that anymore. It's just not fun. It's just not, there's got to be a bigger purpose on why you and I, as a disciple and follower of Christ, have to obey. So I'm hoping today that we can learn how to do that, and that we're not so rebellious like I apparently am. I, I was amazed that when I told Rob after I got done with this lesson, I said, you know, Rob, our earlier books, we went to a church that was very, very heavy on obedience. And, and so there's this theme running through a couple of our books, a couple, a couple, I wonder if that's a word, couple of our books, um, Part-Time Christian Red Letters, that tend is, tends to talk a lot about obedience. And I said, you know what, we need to go and re-edit that, at least putting in there why we're supposed to obey so that it can free people up. So today we're going to talk about that. And this all came from Andy, Stand Andy Stanley. I don't know if most of you know him. He is a pastor back in somewhere back south, east, I don't know where he's at. Um, he is probably, I think, one of the greatest communicators of all time, is my thinking every time I listen to him. But anyway, he, he's doing a series right now. It's called Starting Points. And what he's trying to get people to do is say, look, take everything that you've learned, because everybody has a starting point to everything, a starting point to, to waking up in the morning, a starting point when you're born, a starting point when you get married. Everything's a starting point. So let's take, where did you start with your faith? Okay, and, and wherever that started, you were taught certain things. And a lot of us were taught certain things wrong. And so now, a lot of people walk away from the church. They're like, I don't want to go to church anymore because it's just a bunch of rules and regulations. I don't want to go because I feel bogged down. They tell me I have to do all these things. And so his point is, let's start fresh and say, what does it really mean to be a follower of Christ? But he did one of them that was on rules. And I knew we were going to do this today. So I stole some of his stuff, just an FYI on that. Uh, because it was so good and it helped me so much. I, rem I walked out thinking, I am the freest person I've ever been in my life after hearing this. So I want to um, kind of help us in our adult faith. Because I know for me, I, I was real involved with Campus Crusade in high school. And, you know, you had that child faith. And then I went to college and kind of wandered away and then got married. And I thought, I remember driving saying, I have no idea what this faith has to do with anything in my life. It doesn't do anything for me. And, and that was pretty much this defining moment in my life where I had to determine, am I going to figure out what my faith in Jesus is all about, or am I just going to walk away? And unfortunately, I think a lot of people walk away, and we don't want that. We want to be women who are saying, you know what, I'm going to go forward with this. So I think that a lot of people have religious baggage. I spoke to a girl uh, last week after class, and she comes from, her husband comes from a very Catholic background. And they went to, uh, they had all their kids uh, baptized into the Catholic Church when they were really, really young because that's what they were told that they needed to do. If you're a Catholic, that's what you do. Not coming down in the Catholic Church, just making a point here. Um, and, and she said now they go to a Christian church, and, but they're really struggling with this. My two-year-old is not baptized yet. My husband thinks we should get her, her, the child baptized because they're so ingrained that you have to do that for whatever. And so as we talked, my main point was you're going to have to separate what you've been taught all your life with what does the Bible actually say? Because there's a big difference there. And, and, and baptism is one of those things that you do because 
you say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Now at two, you can't do that. But if you go to the Catholic church or any church that says you have to do these things to belong, then you're going to be all messed up. And so what we want to do is say, I don't want, I want us to start fresh here and say, okay, in this whole idea of obedience, let's see what the Bible has to say about all that. Because I think a lot of us um, our, our backgrounds play into this. If your parents sat around and said, you know, at church, you need to fold your hands and you need to bow your head and you need to dress nicely and you need to do all these things, that's in the back of your mind. Or if your pastor sits down and said, you know what, you're not supposed to drink or chew or go out with boys who do or however that plays out. Like, you, you, don't, you can't do that because our church doesn't allow for things like that. Um, maybe you're, you came from a really different background that says, you know, makeup's bad. You can't wear makeup because it's kind of sinful. And now every morning you love makeup, you put mascara on, but this guilt just overweighs you because you're like, if my grandmother knew I was putting makeup on, she would be so angry with me. Um, it's movies on Sunday. Someone says, hey, you want to go to a movie? Oh, it's Sunday. How could you ever go to a movie on the Lord's Day? I mean, and so you've got all of this baggage that, that's just hanging on to you, and there's a lot of guilt that goes with it, and I say it, it's time to, to get to the bottom of why do I do the things that I do? Why do I obey God? What is my purpose for, for doing that? And I think that how we view God is really important on how we're going to do this whole obedience thing. Because I was thinking if, if you went through life and your parents said, don't touch the stove, and don't play with matches, but they never told you why, then you're going to go through the rest of your life going, I really want to touch that stove because I don't know why I'm not supposed to. And I'm a little rebellious anyway. And I don't know why I can't play with matches because it looks kind of fun. <sighs> There's the fire. So I don't understand why I can't do that. So, but if we get the why into it, I think it will totally help us today. So in order to do this, we have to go back to the beginning, like back to Abraham, okay, way, way back in the, the time, Adam and Eve, and then about 2,000 years later, uh, Abraham shows up on the scene, and I want to talk about the Ten Commandments, because that's kind of the first set of rules that God sits down and gives to the nation of Israel, and so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that, and most people know the Ten Commandments are like, like if I asked you how many Ten Commandments you know, we'd probably name, I know I'm not supposed to kill someone, and I'm not supposed to commit adultery, and possibly maybe, what's another one? Don't steal? Okay, and they're just, there's 10 of them, okay? And I'm mo the, the point is, most of us don't even know them, okay? We just know it's something that we're not supposed to do, okay? But I think that what I'm realizing about the disciples is that whenever Jesus told them to do something, they just did it. Like, they didn't even question him. Because, and, and I wonder, why was that? Why did he, they say, Jesus would say, hey, go do this. Go get in the boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. They didn't say, well, well why? why? Why are you telling me I have to do that? They just did it. Okay, so there was some kind of a relationship that they had that we're missing. So let's go all the way back to Abraham. And we're going to do a little quick little history. Abraham comes on the scene about 2,000 years after Adam and Eve, about 1,400 years before Jesus. And here is um, Abraham. He's living in modern-day Iraq is where, it, where he was at that particular time. Genesis 12, in your handout, this is the first verse we're going to be doing. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay, so we're starting off with Adam or Abraham. Now, I read this little funny thing, and it was a dialogue, and I didn't know how to do it because I couldn't distinguish God's voice from Abraham's voice. So... I made something. My daughter laughed at me when she saw it. I am the most non-creative person you've ever met. Okay, so here's hand puppets. I actually asked my daughter-in-law yesterday, where do I find a puppet? She said, I have no idea. So I made these. This is God, okay? I have no idea why I think God has, has cotton balls all over him, but I'm thinking like, okay, he's, it's holy, it's white, it's clouds. I don't know. This is God, okay? In case okay this is Abraham. Uh, Abraham has a beard and some hair. I had this like fake wig thing that I was going to bring that I forgot. So, okay, so, and you may not even find this funny, okay? <laughs> but I happen to think it was funny and I haven't practiced, so I might not even do this right. Okay, so let's imagine this dialogue between Abraham and God. And so Abraham, or God says, um, wait a second, <laughs> here, <laughs> okay. Abraham, this is God speaking. I want you to leave everything and go to the land that I show you. 
where's that? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Try me. Well, it's about 1,500 miles from here, and it's a place called Canaan. Never heard of it. Hang on. Got to change the page. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I can't remember who's pay- uh, Never heard of it. Oh, I know. And guess what else? What? I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. Well, that's impossible because I don't have any kids. Yeah, I know. But just don't worry about it. Uh, well, what do you mean don't worry about it? I-, I want you to trust me. Just trust me. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, let me see if I got this straight. Uh, you want me to travel all the way across the desert to a place I have never seen nor ever heard of, and now I'm going to become a father of this really great nation. Right. Is this some kind of a joke? No. <laughs> okay. What am I supposed to tell my wife? That's your problem. <laughs> oh, that was so cute. <laughs> all right. So nobody will ever look at God the same anymore, will you? You'll be like, God, you have visions of cotton balls. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Abraham sets out to the new land because he actually did obey God. Modern day Israel is where we know it. The problem is, is that he's supposed to become a nation, but he has no children. So, and if you know the story or you were with us with Genesis, we went through the whole thing about um, Sarah, his wife. You know, they're older. They're like, you know, apparently God doesn't mean we're going to have a baby. So here's my maid, this hot little hagger from Egypt. And, and so she can have a child for us and then that'll be our baby. Well, that just did not work out very well. And there was a lot of issues going on there. And, and we know that today that the, the lineage of Hagar... And Abraham is the whole nation of Israel, or Arab, the Arab nations, so the whole Palestinian and Israeli fight really goes all the way back to, to what just happened there. Anyway, Abraham does have a child, Isaac. Then Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. So we're, gonna, we're just fast-forwarding right through the history here. He has 12 sons. Uh, Ten of the brothers hated one of them, Joseph. So what they did is they decided they're going to throw Joseph in, uh, uh, they're going to sell him to some slave traders. So Joseph ends up in Egypt, okay? Everyone else is in Israel now. The Israelites are in e- Israel. Joseph's now in Egypt. Big famine comes on. Lots of bad things happen to Joseph. He ends up second in command. It's a long story. There's this famine. So all of a sudden, he's one day, he looks out, and there's all of his brothers in front of him. It's the coolest story ever. Anyway, Big reunion, yay! All of his brothers, the whole nation of Israel that's there at this point, moves into Egypt. Okay, so now you're in Egypt, and, and they're, they're growing. I, I always say, apparently, the only thing they knew how to do was have sex and babies, okay? Because that's all that they were doing. Because this whole nation just builds up, and, and you're just like, the Egyptians were going, I don't even know what to do with these people any longer because now Joseph is off the scene. He's, he's died off. We're talking hundreds of years later. And now suddenly the Egyptians are there. They don't even remember Joseph. And all the nation of Israel is, is there. And so what happens is the, the Egypt, um, the Pharaoh decides, let's put the Israelites to work. So we're going to make them our slaves. Okay, so we're going to make them possibly build the pyramids, build the city of Ramses, whatever they, they did. They were now slaves in Egypt. So for 400 years, all they knew was slavery. Now, the only thing that they could know, like if you were an Israelite and your children were being raised, you would want to tell them, hey, guess what? We're going to be a great nation. And they would look at you like, were slaves. I, I know, but way, way, way back, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Father Abraham told us that. But we're slaves. Okay, so it didn't make sense to them, and so they're trying to teach them stories about God, and, and, and not Jesus, but um, Abraham, and, and the, this plan for the nation of Israel. N- no one really could understand it. Then one day, Moses comes on the scene. God raises up Moses, and he says, okay, Moses, I want you to get my people out of Egypt and I want them into the promised land. I want them back into Israel where they belong. Now, when I thought of Moses, I read something else that was kind of cute, and I thought this was kind of funny. During Sunday school one time, there was a pastor, and he decided that he was teaching um, about Moses in the burning bush. bush. So he had his, this uh, uh, middle-aged couple get up, and the woman was supposed to be Moses' part, and the husband was supposed to be God's part. So they were going through all their lines and everything that, that you know, acting this whole scene out. And, and then the woman says, uh, she mistook her husband's dialogue for her own, and she misread it, and she says, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers. And the pastor interrupted her and said, wait a minute, you're not God. And her husband says, I've been trying to tell her that for 18 years. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that, that's just, yeah. 
I, I need a new joke book, I think, today. Anyway, Moses, Moses comes in and tells Pharaoh, let my people go, let them go. And, and Pharaoh's like, heck no, we're not letting your people go. Anyway, of course, God unleashes the most amazing, you know, miracles we've ever seen. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. And, and then Moses says, let's go. We're, we're getting out of here. Everybody, if you're a slave, pack your stuff. We're out of here the next day. And they move out. This is a really fast history, by the way. They all move out from Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. And what I want us to see from that little scene right there is how God feels about you and me. Because he took Moses, he raised up someone and said, I love those people so much. They are my children. They are my property. I love them. I am going to go in and I'm going to rescue them out and give them a new life. And it's kind of the same thing that Jesus does with us. He sends Jesus and says, look, I want to give you a new life. I don't want you to be bogged down by your sin. I don't want you to be, you know, I want you to go to heaven, all those things. But in order for that, we have to have someone that's going to come in and rescue, which we know is Jesus. But for them back then, uh, Moses went and rescued them out of there. Now, three weeks later, they're on Mount Sinai. Moses is up at Mount Sinai, and God is getting ready to give them rules. So he's getting ready to give them the Ten Commandments and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now remember, up to this point, they're slaves. They have no earthly idea what, who God is, what a rule is. Like they've been in slavery. Like here's your rules. Get up, work, go to sleep, and do it the next day. And now suddenly someone's giving them a list of do's and don'ts. But before he gives any rules, this is what, what God tells them in Exodus 20 verse 1. He says, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, the first thing they're probably going is, serious? Like this is the coolest thing. Like we didn't know who God was. And now you're our God. This is the most awesome thing I've ever heard of. We've heard about, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but we've never seen you, known you. We're kind of confused, but now we understand that you're our God. And the one thing that God wants to do is show them Um, I am in a relationship with you. And so anything that I tell you after the Ten Commandments or whatever I give you afterwards is proof that you are mine, that we have this relationship. And, And the problem is they're probably saying, why would you do that? I have not done one thing for you. I was in Egypt. I was a slave. I didn't like quit sinning. I didn't like try to be nice to my neighbor. I don't even know what this all means. And God comes in and says, you are my people and, and I love you. And, and that's the starting point of why people would ever even obey because of this relationship that we have with God. Now, the second thing he says to them in verse three, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now think about that. If someone came to you, got you out of slavery and said, now all I'm asking is don't have any more, or, more gods, you would be like, I get it. Why would I ever want another God? Like, you're awesome. You brought us out of Egypt. You're you're, you're giving us a new land. Our kids have a future. Woohoo! You're my God forever. Okay? That's how it is in their relationship. And for them, you can hear them just kind of saying, I I don't have a problem with that. I want you to be my God, and I'm not going to put any idols in front of you. Um, and, And this is the key. That God did all of this for the nation of Israel before they ever did anything for him. And that's what he does for us. He never said, nation of Israel, I want you to quit sinning. I want you to quit sinning and I want you to be nice to your neighbor and I want you to stop smoking. And when you do that, you know what? We can, you can be part of our family here. He never says that. And, and, and the thing is, is that they didn't even know what it meant to follow God. And yet God went in and rescued them before they even knew anything about him. And it's just a reminder to us how awesome that when, if you were a follower of Jesus, that's exactly what he did to us. He, he drew us to himself. He opened our eyes. He said, I want to rescue you because I want you to be my family. Now, the thing is, is that whenever there is a relationship, there's usually rules. And rules always a relationship precedes any rules that go on. So let's say you go to work and they're saying when you come to work, you have to wear certain clothes, okay? You have a relationship with your work because, and then they tell you what to do. If, you, if I have children, okay, I have a relationship with them and then I'm going to give them the bylaws of the house when their curfew is, what they can and can't do because we have a relationship. And 
I think the problem is, is that we have a difficult time obeying God because we forget that we have a relationship with him. Now, uh, Andy Stanley put this in three categories. He said, you're going to think of obedience in one of these three ways. And, and here's the first one. You may think that obeying God comes under this. It's not in your handout. I, I should have put it in. I'm sorry. So you have to remember this or write it down. He calls it the club model. If you are involved in a club, what happens is they give you a list of rules and regulations. If I want to join Rio Vista, which I did, uh, I have to sign a paper, pay my dues. They give me a list of what I can and can't do. We know I can't wear flip-flops on the walking track. We got that. Um, you know, you can't wear your bathing suit in here. I mean, you do need to cover up. So there's certain rules. Now, if you view God that way, then you're obeying because you're under the club model. Okay, you think you have to do that because that's what you're told. Okay, the second one is called the homeowners association model. Okay, and he said what that looks like is you buy a house, they hand you a thing, you hear you're, you're now a part of the homeowners, and you're like, okay, whatever. You never read the homeowner's manual. How many of us have ever done that? Nobody, okay? And suddenly, your weeds grow to three inches in your front yard, and now, like, you're, the, the National Guard is coming in, you know, and, and they're going to, like, burn down your house or something because you didn't obey the homeowners association, and now you're kind of going, but I didn't even know about that rule. Like, I put my garbage can out on Monday. Nope. Tuesday. If you don't put it out on Tuesday and put it in Tuesday by six o'clock, we're fining you, okay? And a lot of people view God in that same manner. Now, there's those two, and then there's the real model. And this is the model that we need to go under, because a lot of people view obedience under those two models. And the one that God says is this, this idea of a family model. He says, look, we're a family, okay? We do things because we're a family, not so that I'm going to come down and be mad at you and beat you up and do all these kind of things. We are a family. And, and because of that, like Shy and Dusty, we tell them to do things because they're our kids. We love them. We're a part of something. And I think the problem is that if you are raised in a, a place where you kind of think of like this homeowners association model, you, you always walk through life saying, God is just mad at me. If I make one little step, if I let my weed grow one too much, if I gossip one too many times, if I am angry at my husband one more time, God's just going to whack me over the head and find me and, because he hates me that much. I mean, you will live in this, this exhaustion of a Christian life. And you know what? I'd walk away. I, I wouldn't want to live like that. I don't. And I think in my mind, I think out of all these three, I felt so free when I was done with this because I think I always thought that with this homeowners association. I don't know why. No one ever taught me that, but I think somehow I always felt like God was mad at me. And, and, and then, but if you believe in the club model, then you're gonna, you're gonna, someone told you a list of rules and that's gonna bog you down because you're gonna say like, well, my church says I have to do this and I have to do that and I have to do that. And if I don't, you know, God hates me and I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell and, and it, it, all these things. So what we wanna do is we wanna get the, the right model. And the right model here is this idea of God says, I am going into the Israelites and I'm rescuing them because they're my family and I love them. And because I love them, I'm going to give them some per parameters and guidelines. Not because I hate them, but because I love them. I'm not a homeowner. I'm not a club. A club. I am a family. I am their father. And, and, I, and I want them to understand that I am in a relationship with them. And because of that, um, this is what just happens in our family. Now, God does not heap a bunch of rules on us because he wants to make us miserable. Uh, I would tell Cheyenne and Dusty when they first started school, every morning they would walk out the door, I would say to them, and you can just picture them rolling their eyes because they did every time I said this, I'd say, don't forget today, you are a Christian and you are a leisure. Okay, those are the two things I want you to remember because the point is, is that we're a family. You're in you know, God's family and you're in our family. And when you're in those families, we kind of expect you to act a certain way, not because we're trying to heap a bunch of rules on, but because we're a family and families just do these kind of things. And so I think we need to look at, in the context of obedience as when God asks us to do something, he's not doing it out of anger or upset. He's doing it because he really does love us. Now, let's just take, for example, divorce. It's a big hot topic out there, whatever. But for, for just an example, let's just see what this looks like. So let's just say that you 
are very unhappy with your marriage. And so somebody tells you, biblically true, that you have two grounds for divorce. That's it, biblically. If your husband is an unbeliever and he says, look, I can't stand you anymore. I'm walking out the door. And he walks out the door. You are free to get married. And biblically, you've just now got it in a biblical divorce, okay? Or if your husband commits adultery or if you commit adultery, there are grounds for biblical divorce there too. Okay. Now let's just say none of those things happen. You just don't really like your husband, okay? You're just like, he's, I just don't really like him. But you know what? The next door neighbor, he's kind of hot and we kind of meet at the garbage can every so often and we kind of goo eyes each other. And we had coffee and we decided that we're going to leave our spouses because, of course, we would be way better than my husband and I. Okay, so you got this whole plan and then you go to church and you hear, you need to obey. And you're just like, well, I don't want to. Now, under any of those other rules, it would be, I don't want to because I'm afraid God's going to beat me up and get mad and whatever. But under the family rule, it's saying, you know what? I have to realize that my father has these guidelines in there for a reason, to protect me because he loves me. He's not saying it to make me miserable. He doesn't want me. He wants me to stay married because he knows that it will destroy my children. It will destroy my, my witness. Like I've told everyone that I'm a Christian and now what? I'm going to leave my husband and go move in with the next door neighbor? Like what does that do? See, as a family unit, everything changes because now we represent our father. And, and when we do that, now we obey for a completely different reason. And now it's not about me any longer. It's about my family. And so when I put the reasons why I obey now, then it makes it much easier for me to, to do that. Because I'll tell you what, if I didn't know this, then I, would, I tended to find myself just saying, I don't want to obey anymore. I'm tired of rules. But now that I understand I'm part of a family, I'm part of something much, much bigger than just me, then I feel like obedience is just so much simpler because now I know the why behind it. Because God does not set rules up to make our lives miserable. We tell our kids, don't go get drunk. Don't get behind a wheel. Because if you do, I'm not going to be waking you up in the morning, you know, in your nice, comfy, cozy bed. I'm going to be visiting you in a prison cell, okay? So, so we tell you not to do these things, not because we hate you, but because we really have your, your best interest at heart. John 1, 12 says this, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So my hope today is that when we hear this word obey and, and we have received Jesus into our life, then we say, okay, I'm a child of God. I'm part of a family. I'm part of a system. So now I obey because I really, really love God and I want to be a part of his family. If you read through the Old Testament, and you see all these weird prophets come on the stage. You'll see Ezekiel and Isaiah, and they're just weird, and they dress funny, and they, they say weird things. And, but, but it's God's proof to us of how much he loves us because he says to the nation of Israel, you're my children. Well, they went wayward. They would go in and out. I love God. I hate God. I want to do my own thing. I want to worship idols. I want to bow down to a calf. Okay, stupid, stupid stuff. But he would always bring these prophets on the scene to beg the Israelites, please come back. Come back to me. I love you that much. They were, they, he wanted them because they were part of his family. And that's the God that we serve. Someone says, I love you. You're part of my family. And, and if we can remember that when it's time to, um, to obey, I think it probably will, will help us. Now, I want to, hopefully this will give you a little bit of comfort because I got off on this whole family thing. And I started thinking that a family also is a place where you can mess up. Okay, and, and still God will still love you. And that's really hard because I think for me in the homeowners thing, I always feel like if I mess up, God hates me. And I, I was just talking to someone the other day. He said, what do you do when you sin? And I said, you know, I don't spend much time on it. I say, God, that was stupid. Help me not to do that. Sorry. And I move on. Because if I want to dwell on it, Satan will do nothing but make my life more miserable if I just constantly are dwelling. I'm just the worst person. God has to hate me. I I just never can live up to this Christian life. Forget it. God, I'm sorry. Change me. I don't want to be that way anymore. And move on. Okay, it's really that simple. Because we're never going to stop sinning. Hopefully, we're going to sin less and less and less and less, but we're never going to stop, okay? I was just reading in Galatians the other day, and I was shocked at this, and I don't know why I was. I see this scene where, where Paul is talking to Peter, okay? Now, it's probably been 20 years since Jesus has been gone, okay? And they're all sharing the gospel. But Peter's doing something really stupid, 
and he's being really hypocritical, and, and Paul's angry with him, and he's like, what are you, and I was reading that, and I'm thinking, Peter, like our Peter, our walk on water Peter, our, I denied Jesus, but now I serve him all my life Peter, okay, he's 20 years into this thing, and he's still doing stupid stuff, okay, so we got to get this, we're going to mess up, okay, but what do we do with it afterwards is what we have to talk about, but I, I was thinking about this with most of you no, Micah, if you have been here, he's my son, he's 20-some years old, suffer from really serious depression. And uh, we interviewed him one time on depression and, and uh, suicide. And the problem with Micah growing up was that I always trusted him. Like, I always believed. When Micah told me something, I just absolutely believed him that because I, just, I always trusted my kids. They would never lie to me, okay? So he was kind of our wayward child. And Rob finally looked at me one day and he said, you know he's lying to you. And I said, he would never lie to me, okay? But I knew he went someplace that day that he wasn't supposed to because someone called me and told me. So I thought, I'm going to prove this to everyone. Hey, Micah. So I started getting in this conversation with him, you know. He lied bold face to me. I was so shocked. I was like, what? I could hurt my feelings. And it was like, but I'll tell you what I didn't do. I didn't say, get out. You're not part of our family anymore. You're done. Out of here, you know. We never said that because they're my family and families don't do that. They say, you know what, I'm going to work with you to get you better. I'm not going to just kick you out. Just an FYI for those of you that have teenage children or grandchildren, um, I'm going to give you a little advice. We are on our seventh 15-year-old, okay? Uh, we're, we're, and we, we're still alive and we've made it, okay? We can't wait till, you know, we're past this stage. But here's a little advice. They are going to say things, and they are going to do things, and they are going to smoke things, and they are going to drink things, and they are going to watch things that you do not want them to. You are not going to approve, okay? But you can't kick them out of your family because they do. It's part of life, and God is going to teach them through that. It's our job as parents to come alongside of them and say, these are the reasons why we don't want you to drink, smoke, watch, blah, 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 because it's going to harm you in your future. So we've got to realize that. Expect it. Don't be like, oh, they just broke my heart. They're going to break your heart. Just plan on it because that's what kids do. You know, I, I love it. My kids are like, oh, I can't wait to have a baby. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> just wait, okay, because your heart will be broken the rest of your life, you know, and then it's the grandkids, and then they do stupid stuff, and you're just like, I just want to go to heaven, okay. <laughs> so, but anyway, when we teach our kids, but the one thing that we do teach the kids, which I think God also teaches us, which he t taught the Israelites, is that there are consequences to our actions. And we've got to remember that. If you go to a party and you get drunk and you get in an accident and you kill someone, you're still in the family, but you're going to be living somewhere else, you know, in a nine by nine cell, okay? Those are just consequences to stupid things. Doesn't mean you're not a part of our family. Cheyenne uh, is 18. Thankfully, she turned 18. When she was 16... To 18, to a month before she turned 18, she has a trait that I think all leisure people have, which means we like to speed. We're never, we're always in a hurry, we got to get there faster, and we get a lot of tickets, okay? She was one ticket away from getting her license suspended. At 18, she would have a clean slate, so we're just working for her to get to 18, okay? Because we knew if her license is suspended, it ruins my life, okay? Because now I have to drive her to work and drive her to school, and I'm like, I just don't want to do that. So, what we did was we were in Flagstaff, and she calls me absolutely hysterical. Mom, a policeman just pulled me over, and, you know, I think she's dying. You know, she's like, I got a speeding ticket, and she's crying and sobbing. She goes, he's so mean. I told him that my license would be suspended, and he told me, she goes, he told me that I would deserve to have that happen to me. Okay, he wasn't very nice. Anyway, he lets her off. And so we were very, very thankful for that. Two days later, on her way home, she gets stopped again. Okay. So it calls the same sob story. She's crying. She's carrying on. And anyway, thankfully, he also gave her grace. So thank you, Jesus, for that. But we try to tell her, you are in a relationship with the state of Arizona. Okay? They have rules. And the rules are, do not go over the speed limit. And if you do, there's going to be a consequence. So understand that when you have a relationship with somebody, there's going to be rules, not because the state of Arizona hates you. They really would like you to stay alive along with all the people that are driving next to you. And the last thing I wanted to talk about real quick is how families, being a part of this family of God, we're supposed to help each other out. 
There is nothing that frustrates me more in this church, the church, big church, not little church where we go to church, but that we just don't tend to care for those that are in our family. We just don't. You know, I'm the worst at it, so I'll, I'll be totally honest with that. It's like, oh, so-and-so's sick. Would you like to go take them a meal? No, okay? I don't cook, so no. Um, so-and-so's sick. Do you want to go visit them? No. I don't even know. What would I say to him? I'll send Chris. Chris knows how to talk to people, okay? <laughs> so I'm like the worst at this, and, and, I, and I get that. So I'm talking to myself as I'm talking to everyone else. But... What I realized is when Micah went through his depression, we took him to see, uh, we found what we thought was a good doctor. He was so, like I told you, we didn't think he was going to live. You know, there was two times that I walked in and said, he's going to kill himself tonight, I just know it. Um, He, we found a doctor for him. They diagnosed him with double depression. They put him on all this medication, which did nothing but make it worse. Like he was a mess, an absolute mess. And so anyway, we decided because we're his family, we have to help him. We didn't sit around and say, what's your problem? Why are you depressed? Step out of it. That's ridiculous that you would act like that. You have everything in this world to be happy about. Okay, he's depressed. I cannot make this better for him. So I, don't, I think we do that sometimes with, with, with other Christians. Stop sinning. Stop gossiping. Stop talking like that. Stop cussing. Stop doing... Okay, could we just be a little more gracious to people, that might be a really good idea. But what we did is we found this place for Micah to go to, and it was kind of an outpatient thing. It was so expensive, unbelievably expensive. We had no money. And I remember walking the mall, just crying, just going, God, I don't know how we, we have to help him. He's our family. We have to help him. And God, you know, we took a little from here and a little from here and maxed out this credit card, did whatever we could because he's our family. And that's what God does with us. We have this thing in our head that says, I have a porn problem. I have a gossip problem. I'm addicted. I have an eating disorder. I eat too much. I eat too little. I throw up because I can't stand to gain weight. Whatever your issue is, okay? Whatever it is, we think God is mad at us. But what if, honestly, what if we just started looking at things differently and saying, you know what? I have all those problems. I really do. But I'm in a family, And my God loves me so much that he says, when you come to me, I'm going to put my spirit within you. And and that's going to give you the ability now to get over your addiction, to quit watching porn, to stop eating if you need to, whatever. I'm not mad at you. I want to help you through this. But somehow we've got this homeowners club association model in our brain and if we can switch it over to the family and realize that God is on our side he's not he's not against us he's for us now I was going farther but I'm not going to I want to go to the very very end and I'll hit on all this other stuff next week but where we're going to go next week is that we're going to talk about uh, when Jesus told the disciples to obey and they did sometimes they found themselves in a really bad situation. Like they said, he says, go cross the Sea of Galilee. Monster mother of a storm comes up, okay? They're stuck out there. They're fearful. They're frightened. So sometimes we're going to talk about when God tells us to do something and we do it, it might be harder than if we hadn't have done it. So that's where we're going to go next week. But I want to end today, and it's at the very, very last page of your um, thing. I wrote mine differently than yours. Oh, no, I didn't. Here it is. And this is what I thought. I want I wanted us, the very last thing, I, I made it in bolder print. So put it on your refrigerator, memorize it, do whatever. Because I want us to start looking at God, our relationship with him, how we obey him in light of this. I am in a family, a really awesome family, safe and secure. And because I'm in this awesome family, I want to do everything I can to represent my father well. Not to make him love me, but in response to him loving me first. And if we could just live like that, do you know how much freedom that we would have? And then people would go, you know what? I want to be a follower of Jesus. Because you know what? You have the most freest life. And yeah, you screw up. And yeah, you say stupid things. You gossip. And you know, you you apologize to me. And it's an ongoing thing. But I get that. But you're free. You're not bogged down by all these rules and regulations. And so that was my whole heart today because I know how much that helped me change my life. So... Come back next week and we'll talk about if I obey God, will it always be easy? Pretty sure the answer to that will be no.